mentioned here, as did uh, ETH3, talking about the mission model as a of particle physics. So, a bit of a bit. Thanks a lot, Gaia. So, I'm really happy that I got this slot now. Uh, this is my great pleasure. Um, to talk because my talk will bridge kind of the previous one we had about compression for large language models and also the other part on foundation models offline where you kind of have infinite compute and, and infinite time. So I wanted to start with a, a cold open um, just explaining why what we do in particle physics is very different from what people do generally in computer science. So. We heard from Anna that they have problems annotating their data simply because it's a lot of data and it takes a lot of time and resources. For us, we physically cannot annotate our data because of quantum mechanics. So every time we have a proton collision at CERN, a Higgs is produced, it's not produced, and it's both produced and not produced at the same time. So superposition of those. We can never label our data, it doesn't exist. So the only thing we can do is measure things a trillion times and try to extract amplitudes of things being background only or signal. We can only do amplitudes, there's no labeling. So this is kind of moving towards why we're interested in self-supervised self learning, semi-supervised learning. We have no labels on the data. Because of that, we need to deal with this domain where we either need to use simulated data, so we have a domain shift between what we're training on and what we're testing on, or we need to figure out a way of training uh, self-supervised or unsupervised. In order to have labels, what we do is produce highly accurate simulation. Uh, so in our field, we have simulation that's accurate from over 20 orders of length scale, so from 10 to the minus 18, roughly the size of the Higgs boson, up to 100 meters the size of, uh, of our detectors. And we can really produce particles at very small length scales and propagate them through a full 100 meter detector very, very accurately. And having our unlabeled data set and our simulated data sets also defines how uh, we train algorithms. So we have roughly 40 quadrillion collisions, so real data unlabeled at the LHC, and orders of the trillion simulated events that we can use for training machine learning algorithms. So we have a lot of really high quality simulated data, and that's really, really unique. When you talk to people in, in AI, this is something that they really think, wow, that's fantastic. You have this very accurate simulated data with labels, and we want to use that. Secondly, we have vast amounts of unlabeled data where we want to be able to train self-supervised or unsupervised. So note that this simulation is not the test data. So whenever we train an algorithm here, we test it there. So that means there's naturally a domain shift that can be a problem, yes or no. And usually our simulation is a standard model background processes. That's like the bulk of the statistics. So this first signal processes we're looking for, we usually have very little statistics. And so we also wanna do self-supervised learning on uh, the simulated data because we're often looking for a signal which has those statistics. Okay, so at, we were also talking about uh, where AI in physics can contribute back to uh, the machine learning sciences. And we've been really, really proud in high energy physics. We've been doing machine learning for very, very long. So since the early 90s, we invented the World Wide Web. We have vast amounts of data that we have to analyze. Um, and up until today, where we're now publishing a lot of uh, machine learning papers. So this year, there's been 100 papers so far. For instance, Till mentioned yesterday that also for the discovery of the Higgs boson, we used machine learning. So we have been using machine learning for discovery. So if we hadn't used machine learning, in this case, it was seven BDTs basically to enhance signal over background, we wouldn't have discovered the Higgs in 2012. We would have discovered the Higgs seven years later. So we can really use machine learning to enhance uh, sensitivity. So here you can also see that for a vast of different types of searches for the Higgs boson, the additional data we would need if we didn't have machine learning. So we would need a factor of two more data um, or we use machine learning. So we've been really good at, in using machine learning for discrimination. And now we're obviously also following uh, the hype train of large language models, foundation models, self-supervised learning, um, so we currently have this week uh, the ACAT workshop or conference, Advanced Computing and Analysis Techniques, which especially focuses on foundation models for physics. 
two of the latest paper on, on Inspire were also on foundation models. One of them was, was from Phil a few days ago. So this is really something that's catching our, our field eyes on. So that's where the foundation models part comes from. Then we also heard from Sid yesterday that where can AI and physics be kind of a new frontier? Where can physics drive machine learning? And he mentioned extremely fast real-time inference. So in my title, I have edge uh, foundation models, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in the following. So one thing uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of is that at the LHC, we're really at this extreme edge of very, very fast inference and huge data rates. So here you can see as a function of how fast you have to make a decision and how much data is going through your system, we have to be way faster and process way more data than, for instance, Netflix or the Google Cloud. Um, so we're really in this domain that out of necessity, we need way faster algorithms than what most people do, which is currently driving new AI uh, algorithms. Then we also heard from Simon. Uh, when he was presenting um, his talk on material science on a, a huge model that they were using with 60 million parameters, and that's kind of where we want to go. So the topic of my talk will be, can we combine 12 microsecond inference latency with 100 million parameter models? Can we do it? And how can we do it? So we also had a chat over lunch about GPT. and. For me, it's a tool I use basically every day. Every time I write a paper, I ask, hey, I need this reference that is in big text and IEEE style. Please give it to me. And it takes a few seconds and I get the perfect IEEE style reference. I used it this morning, I used it yesterday. I use it all the time. And I talked to a colleague of mine uh, at Google and I said, hey, what do you think? Like, is this, this is great what this model is doing. Has it learned language? Does it understand language? And he said, no, it just has so many parameters it can, it can, it's just memorizing basically everything. It's such a huge space. It hasn't, it doesn't, hasn't learned anything. It's not smart. It just has so many parameters. It can basically do things our brain can't encompass. And obviously, we want to get on that train too. We want to use big AI for discovery. Like we had watched Oriole at CERN talking about alpha fold. So before alpha fold, we knew 10% of how the 20,000 proteins in our bodies fold. After alpha fold, we know over 98%. So this has been huge for, for discovery uh, in science. And this is where we want to go in physics. Can we really use big models to do uh, new things? The problem is that, like I said before, these models are great because they are simply huge. So GPT-3 was 175 billion parameters. GPT-4 is a mixture of experts, 16 experts, roughly 10 uh, orders of magnitude bigger. So if once we want to take advantage of these models, they have to become big. That's what makes them powerful. And even just to train GPT-4, you need a massive supercomputer. Not a lot of people have a massive supercomputer. 25,000 A100 GPUs trained for 100 days, $63 million on 13 trillion tokens, which is like a 800 kilometer long book. And those resources aren't that easy to come by. For inference, where I work, GPT-4 runs on multiple clusters with 128 GPUs. Each GPU is $20,000, something like that. And the model has been carefully mapped onto that hardware to minimize latency. So the model is really designed with the cluster uh, in mind. So these models are growing huge, and it's a general trend. Before in computer vision, the models weren't scaling that fast. But now that we have transformers, they grow extremely fast by a factor of 240 every two years. And our hardware, on the other hand, only grows by a factor of two uh, or so every two years. We can't fit a single model uh, on uh, a single GPU. We also see that these type of models, the performance, so pairs smaller is better, gets better the more compute you throw at the problem, the more data you throw at the problem, and the bigger the model is. And we have to live in this space where the model simply cannot be big because we have to do inference in a millionth of a second. So where are we contributing back to the field of machine learning? So whereas uh, OpenAI and GPT, every time you ask it a problem, is running on 128 interconnected GPUs, and you wait four to 14 seconds before you get your answer, whereas that's fine for them, 
For us, we have tens or so of single chips, and we have to process 5% of the internet traffic um, within a million of a second. So huge data rates, very, very low latency. So that's where we are currently pioneering uh, machine learning. So can these two be united? Can we do big foundation models at the other side? So first I want to talk a little bit about where that data comes from. So this is the Large Hadron Collider. I work here. This is my experiment. This is roughly 100 meters underground, and here we have a 27-kilometer ring. In that 27-kilometer ring, when we're taking data, we have 2,500 bunches at all times spaced by 8 meters. Each of this bunch has trillions of protons, something like that, and they spin around 11,000 times per second. Then we bring them to collide in the center of the four different detectors along the ring. So that's what you see here. We bend them together and we bring them to collide. Every time they collide, roughly 60 protons from the one bunch collides with 60 protons from the other bunch. Then the energy of the incoming protons get converted into mass of new outgoing particles. And those particles traverse through the detector through billions of sensors. And they generate Higgs voltages. Bleep, 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 bleep. And we have to reconstruct them and analyze that data. So we have to probe a lot of particles. So these are the particles we're probing, quarks, leptons, quarks carriers, and their masses span nine orders of magnitude. And we have to be sensitive to all of them. So there's a lot of different particles with very different properties, and we need to be sensitive to all of them, which is why we have um, multimodal detectors. So this is what a detector looks like. So we have an interaction in the middle, the particles are produced, and then they traverse through the detector. And we measure them at every single layer. And these detectors have different sort of qualities, different uh, basically data that they store from the particle. So here you can see, for instance, if the muon goes through the detector, it kind of traverses the whole thing. And if we have a quark that goes through, you see it in the silicon tracker, and it dumps all of this energy in the hadron calorimeter. So it's a lot of different types of detection material, and we have to use basically all of them. Okay, so when we look for things like the Higgs boson, we have a collision, and then we see something that looks like a Higgs. So in this case, you have a Higgs decaying to two vector boson that decays to two green leptons and two green muons. We collide over and over and over and over again, and we try uh, to produce Higgs bosons. So for instance, when we discovered the Higgs boson, we collided billions of protons. So we repeat the process a billion times. Some of those events are background and some of them are Higgs bosons. And then we had roughly 10 signal events that constituted the discovery of the Higgs boson of those trillions of collisions. So that's how we do physics. And this is what we're trying to measure. So we're trying to measure the parameters of the standard model, all of the different processes in the standard model very, very accurately. Okay, so our problem is that we produce orders of a petabyte of data every single second. Ideally, we want to read out all of that data because we do physics analysis with it, but we can't. And the reason we can't is because this is a detector that it has active detection material. So if you have silicon, you want the particle to go through the silicon and you detect that the particle went through. If you want to read out data, you need power and you need chips. So that means you have dead material. There's no longer detection material, you have dead material, and the particle maybe crashes into that dead material, and you lose the particle. So the more chips and cabling you put in there, the less things you see. So even if we could uh, read out all of that data, we kind of couldn't because our detector would be okay. There would be just cables, there would be no detection material. So we can't read out all the data. So what do we do instead? Um, so what we do instead is take advantage of the fact that we're not interested in all of the data. So don't look at this plot, just follow my, my, my voice. So this is the energy we're running the LHC at. That green line is the probability of producing anything at all in our detector. This blue line is the probability of producing a Higgs boson. So it's orders of magnitude less than the probability of producing anything. So we're actually, even if we could store all of the data, we're not really interested in all of it. So if we could save everything, it wouldn't even be that useful. So taking advantage of that fact, we make an ultra fast decision about which are the Higgs bosons or interesting processes. So what we do in practice is reducing the rate in real time. So in CMS where I, I am, we do that in two steps. Also in Atlas, we have a hardware step, which has to be super fast. And then we have a software step where we have a little bit more time. 
So in the other experiments, some of them have smaller data rates and can read everything out on GPUs uh, or continuously, but I'll focus on, on this one. So what we do here is kind of cool. So you have a collision and all of the data of the detector is stored temporarily inside the detector. So the data never leaves the detector. We have uh, tiny chips inside the detector with buffering capability. So all of that data lives inside the detector. And the buffer, the buffer length is currently four microseconds. So we can keep data for four microseconds and it has to leave that system because the buffer is full. So the data lives inside the detector. Then we take a subset of that data and we send it out to what we call the level one trigger. So here we have high speed optical links that goes through a radiation shielded cavern right next to the detector. It doesn't go to the surface, it doesn't go anywhere else because the speed of light is a limitation. Sending data takes too much time. So it's right next to the detector. And there we have thousands of FPGAs that have to decide which events to keep within four microseconds. If it hasn't made a decision within four microseconds, this buffer is full. So then we have to flush the data, no matter what. Within four microseconds, it has to be done. And it has to reject more than 99% of all of the collisions. So within a few millionths of a second, we are discarding 99% of all of the collisions. It has one job, and that is to send one number out. Again, it's 1,000 FPGAs, again, $15,000 per FPGA, and it sends out one number. And that's a zero or it's a one, more or less, <laughs> one number. If it's a zero, we reject the event. We'll never see that data again. It's flushed out and we will never know what happened to it. If it's a one, we read out the full detector. So upon receiving a one, the, detect the data kindly leaves the cavern. It gets sent to the surface. Um, and now you have only kind of 1% of that data left. It gets sent to the surface. And it's still too much data for us to look at and read out and store. So here, since there's less data, we have more time. We have a software trigger of roughly 30,000 CPUs that looks a bit finer at the data and then rejects a further 99% of the original data. Only after that step do we actually do a full reconstruction and storage of all of the data. And here we're left with roughly 0.0025%. So that means that that whole system needs to be extremely fast to make sure we select the right 0.0025% of data, really, really fast and really, really accurate. Now, we're not interested in the Higgs boson anymore. We found it. So what we're really interested in is looking for new physics. And all of these plots represents a search for a new type of particle that we have currently excluded. But we're looking for more because we know there has to be a new physics beyond the standard model. New physics is really, really rare. So Higgs boson produced one in a billion. New physics has produced one in a trillion, if at all. So we need more data uh, in order to see new physics. So we're investing in what we call the high luminosity LHC. So we're upgrading the complete uh, detectors, the accelerator complex, to take more collisions. So the way we're going to do that is have two times more protons in each bunch. So instead of one trillion, it's two trillion. Squeeze them tighter together and smash them, um, smash them together. So we're going to have roughly 10 times more uh, data than we have now. Now that's great. We have a factor of 10 more data. The problem is that the event complexity will go up uh, by an enormous amount. So before we had roughly 60 protons from each bunch colliding simultaneously every time the bunches cross. In the future, we're going to have 200. And we need to disentangle every single one of these collision vertices and all of the particles. So it's going to be a very challenging task uh, in the future. So in order to even disentangle all of those tracks, we invest in better detectors. So they're way more complex. For instance, as a calorimeter before we had uh, like 60,000 readout channels, now it's 60 million. So we have far more data, more collisions, more readout channels, so huge uh, complexity. One of the biggest upgrades will be in this level one trigger system. You remember the one that initially got rid of 99% of the data. So a crucial bottleneck that the data needs to go through. This will have a complete upgrade. All of those FPGAs will be taken out and replaced. And it has some cool features. So for the very first time in a level one trigger system, we will have charged particle tracks, which means we have way better resolution of the energy and direction of all of the particles. And they will be processed on roughly 200 FPGAs, a 6.4 terabits per second. It's an enormous amount of data. We have to reconstruct in a millionth of a second. 
you have this um, something called particle flow that can combine the information from the charge tracks and the calorimetry, which is now the best reconstruction we will do. We can do offline. It's now done in a millionth of a second, 100 meters underground online. And we have this high granularity calorimeter. And those things means that the input data rate that we currently have of two terabits per second will go to 63 terabits per second. Like I said, that's 5% of the internet traffic on 1,000 FPGAs, 100 meters underground. So it's a lot of data. And the time will go up because we have more, we need more time to process that data. So we can do more complex things. And we need to do more complex things because we have extremely high data complexity and extremely little time. So this is where we want to use machine learning basically everywhere. So here you can see what it looks like. This is a student, my Noah, walking through these racks of FPGAs. You can see there's cable between each of the boards. And it's not like those 1,000 FPGAs just do what they want. We have 400 of them that does calorimetry, 200 of them that does tracking, a bunch of them that does the combination of all of the bad information before you have the single zero and one out. So what Phil and I have been working on for the past couple of years is um, is designing algorithms for this brand new system. It is not yet built and the time to design algorithms is now. And this is the place where we're interested in using foundation models instead of these little, little steps of reconstruction and selection, one big model, maybe even one output in like the most extreme case. So we have 12 microsecond latency processing 5% of the internet traffic. We have way more granular input, which will allow us to do way better physics and way cooler things. We expect so far um, that we will have roughly 40 billion inferences per second during high open loss LAC. So we've been working on these libraries where you can design very fast machine learning algorithms and put them on FPGAs. Each of the sticker represents one such algorithm. And this has allowed us to completely redesign the system from a system free of machine learning to doing 40 billion inferences per second. That has been our job for the past couple of years, basically, which I'm told is equal to all the inferences running at Google. Okay, now, <laughs> this is the question I always get asked. I show that graph and people are like, yeah, but why? I mean, you have a bunch of complex input and your output is a binary, it's a zero or one. Why, why aren't you doing, why aren't you doing this? And that's the step where we want to go and see how far can we get down to one large model that does everything, a full embedding and a final bit one out. Okay, so we want to go from the current system that we have that's in all these kind of sequential steps to some end-to-end -end reconstruction model with some latent representation, like a foundation model, feeding a bunch of downstream tasks, which can be different types of selection algorithms, for instance. So in order to get that, we have to understand uh, the hardware and we have to understand how we can make models small and how to make models fast. So first I'm gonna talk about why we're using FPGA. So we're one of the biggest purchaser of Xilinx slash AMD FPGAs in the world. The reason we're using them is only because of latency. You cannot do anything on a GPU in four microseconds. You cannot do anything on a GPU. So we utilize what we call resource parallelism. So we have one problem and we have a bunch of resources working on the same problem. We also utilize pipeline, oh, pipeline parallelism where we can have a bunch of different collision events run, being processed in parallel. So we have one collision, those guys are working on that. Another collision, they're working on that, another one. So we can do a lot of collisions in parallel to get data through the system fast enough. So the reason we're using FPGAs is just latency. And we can work on different parts of the problem, different data. For instance, in our tracking algorithm, we're running on 18 collision events simultaneously before we spit them out. It's also because they're latency deterministic. So when you run code on your laptop, you don't care if it's five nanoseconds faster, five nanoseconds slower, we care. It needs to be accurate on the nanosecond, basically. So latency deterministic. And uh, high bandwidth. So we have a lot of data that needs to go through the system. So if you have a trans huge transformer and you want to put it on that PJ and you want it to run in a millionth of a nanosecond, you need to do a lot of engineering. So the way you usually do that at a higher level is that you write some C++ code with some of your constraints. You say, I want this algorithm to be super parallel. 
You pass it to a compiler from your SDJ vendor that compiles it into a hardware description language and gives you a firmware blockout. Now, we're physicists. Most of us are not electrical engineers. So if you're going to do that part efficiently, you need some expertise. But we want a lot of machine learning algorithms running in that system. So we want to make that step easy. So that's why we designed these libraries called uh, HLS for ML and Conifer, where you can train a model in your favorite uh, ML library, pass it to us. We will completely unroll it so that everything that can be done in parallel will be done in parallel and give you out something that you can put on an ASIC or an FPGA in Python, basically, to make it low threshold for people to develop these algorithms. So here you can see an example of a small CNN uh, on MNIST mapped out with, with HLS or ML onto an FPGA. And there's one reason I'm showing you this, and that's because this is a very tiny CNN, and it's filling up the full FPGA. So for us, since we have to do things so fast, like the algorithm I'm currently working on, we have a constraint of 50 nanoseconds. It cannot be faster than 50 nanoseconds, then it's not going into the system. We can't afford to put the weights of the network on off-chip memory because it takes so much time to send the data back and forth. That's a bottleneck, so everything is on-chip. So we need very, very tiny models, and so far we've just been putting everything on-chip. But if we're going to go to the 100 million parameter domain, that will have to change. So ideally, we want to put this huge model that Simon showed on our FPGA, but in reality, we simply cannot because we're, we're resource and we're time constrained, mostly time constrained. So we do a lot of things to reduce the size of the network, and we heard a lot about that in the previous talk. One of the most powerful things we do, which we talked about in the previous talk as well, is reducing numerical precision. So for instance, GPT in surveying is at floating point 16, so it's been quantized. Um, in order to have basically the size of the network. So this is something everyone does. Everything that has a deploy model reduces the numerical precision of the network. So the way uh, you do that is that you go from whatever you train in floating point 32, which has a lot of numbers, a huge uh, dynamic range, very high density around zero, so very granular. And you put all of those numbers in little buckets, basically. So for instance, if you have int eight, you suddenly only have 256 discrete numbers. You round the numbers to their nearest buckets and you flip them off. So suddenly you only, you have way less um, granularity, but often for machine learning weights, you don't really need, you don't need like a huge dynamic range, for instance. But you can do better. That's, we talked about that before too. Um, post-training quantization versus quantization aware training. So in post-training quantization, you train the network, you accept that you put the numbers in buckets afterwards and you accept there will be some loss. But you can also do what's called quantization aware training, where you let the network know what will be the precision on the hardware. So if I know already I'm gonna use four bits, I tell the network, you will be a four bit network. You can only choose between these 60 numbers, whatever. So we want to put every single one of those weights into tiny buckets and make sure that the network optimizes appropriately. So the way in which you can do that uh, is through what's called quantization aware training, where you tell the network at train time that this will be a four bit number and back propagation, everything is floating point for a technical reason. You can't compute a gradient for the operation that puts them in buckets basically. Uh, and then the network is aware of the precision it will have on the hardware. And that's the most powerful thing you can do for, for a machine learning model. And you can do it really easily. If you're used to Keras, you can use QKeras and put a Q in front of each of the layers. We also use pruning that we talked about before. I think pruning is a really underestimated technique. So pruning, like we talked about, is basically removing weights that contribute little to the overall accuracy. So you basically set them to zero. On FPGA, every multiplication with zero will be optimized away, so you save a lot of the resources. Here, that whole spike of weights is just not uh, considered anymore. And pruning is kind of cool. So what a lot of people do that have the compute capacity to have really big models at training time is that they make um, huge models, basically, and then um, try to find the winning network within the model. So what you, what's usually the thought about pruning is that once you prove some weights, you're not you're you're not very robust against noise. So here you can see as a function of how many weights uh, you remove, the accuracy goes down once you add noise to your images. 
And here you can also see once you prune very many of the waste accuracy goes down, but that's not true. If you have over-parameterized networks, if you choose the right pruning method, you can find a winning model inside your model. So this plot, I think, is really cool. As a function of the number of weights you remove from the network, you can see the accuracy where up is better. And you can see that the pruned model performs better than the unpruned model. So it's basically found a lottery ticket model inside the network. So if you can afford it, over-parameterize, make your model huge, prune it, and you'll find the optimal model for your problem that's smaller. So that's led to our current flow of how we're putting models in this system. We start with some floating point models. We know, okay, this is the best you can do. We compress it as much as we can, parallelize it as much as we can, and then we put it on hardware. And that's allowed us to do currently some cool things uh, that we have uh, in the system, as we saw uh, before. Just wanted to point out a few examples before we move to the, the big next step. So one of the examples is this, this granular calorimetry. So inside the detector, we have sensor data that needs to get out of the detector. We can't take all of it. So we need to do compression inside the detector. High radiation and often cooled. For instance, this one is cooled to minus 30 degrees. So we have this beautiful 3D calorimeter. And the problem is that we can't read out all of the data fast enough for the level one to make a decision. Remember, we have for 12 microseconds in the future. So a great resolution, but we can't use it. What are we going to do? So when we send data to the level one trigger, we have this small ASICs on the, the, the sensors themselves that have the job of sending the data out. And we have to kind of reduce that data amount in some way. So what we're thinking of doing is using machine learning for that. So using, using an autoencoder to compress the data to a lower dimensional embedded space, decompress it again. Now, what we want to do is put the, the encoder inside the detector. Again, minus 30 degree needs to run at very, very low power and then send the encoded data out of the detector. And once it's out, we do whatever we want to do with that data. Either you reconstruct it or you leave it at risk. Okay. We're also very interested in how we can use symmetries in our network to perform better. So we're really trying to study, okay, what symmetries do we need? Do we need invariance? Do we need equivariance? Do we need to think of the data as graphs? Do we need that information or is it sufficient to think of it as sets? And we're really trying to benchmark as a function of the complexity of the input. Do we need interaction networks? Do we need the interaction between particles or is it enough to treat the data as a set? And you can also see when you compare algorithms like set based versus interaction nets, you can save a lot in time and resources by choosing uh, the properties of your architecture very carefully. So that's something that we're trying to think a lot about before moving to kind of big, big models for big tasks. We're also trying to do things completely differently. Um, so the way we currently do our selections, you know, the zero versus one is that we look at some feature that we know very well, like the energy of the muon, and we say, okay, every interesting, everything that's interesting has a muon with an energy about 18 GeV, or a jet with an energy about 320 GeV, whatever. But you can very well imagine that what you're actually interested in lives down there. Uh, so one of the things we're currently running now is to design an algorithm that really learns uh, from the data itself. So train on the data, learns what is anomalous um, and what is uh, a normal data. And for that, we again use an autoencoder, train it on the detector data, compress it into a lower dimensional embedded space, and learn to decompress it again. We saw that the bulk of the data is standard model data. One in a trillion is beyond standard model physics, so it won't learn that part. It learns standard model physics. Once you have a non-standard model event coming through, it can't properly reconstruct it because it hasn't been trained to do so. So the difference between the input and the output can give you a degree of, of abnormality. And we're currently now selecting 300 events per second of this anomalous data uh, in CMS that we hope to scrutinize. Yeah, so now we rather select on whatever is considered abnormal by the algorithm. We also do a lot of different things. This is really touching on how we can really pioneer the field of AI. We do things like computer vision, brain implants, quantum control, fusion, etc. So these really low latency algorithm is changing the way a lot of people uh, can do their work better, essentially. Okay, so let's discuss this part. I think it was Anna who also said, like, you were talking about foundation models, and you said, yeah, this won't be a success story. So this will be definitely not a success story. It will be all of our thoughts about the paths we want to go forward. 
So now we want to go here. I think we've done really, really well on the small neural networks for specific tasks. How can we go here? So what we want to do is what's usually done for foundation and backbone models. It's assume you have some multimodal input, pre-train, self-supervise, either on the simulation we have or the unlabeled data we have, to create your backbone that you can then fine tune on whatever downstream task that you have. For us, this will look like this. Again, it's a heterogeneous detector, so the input will be multimodal. You have a track, you have a calorimeter, you have muon chambers, everything's different. Pre-train either on the data itself or on simulation, we have to figure it out. And then you have your backbone that you can find to do trajectory construction, electronic construction, pilot removal, anomaly detection, or maybe even give you a simple zero or one out. So currently what we have is some tiny neural networks here, four tiny neural networks here, few neural networks, PDTs there, all doing the same kind of discriminating task. We have some input that maps it to some y hat. So we have these hundreds of different, well, tens and tens of different models that aren't really learning a lot. They're do, learning to do very simple things like, uh, is this a B-jet or is this a core to one jet? So we wanna learn more. So what we wanna do instead is really take the detector data and create a powerful neural embedding that will be powerful for very many different types of downstream tasks. So our biggest issue now is figuring out how we can build that space most efficiently, respecting basically physical, physical law. So what we want to do is try to figure out how we can learn self-supervised on particle physics data by essentially looking at the data itself to really go over it piece by piece, analyze every single aspect of it, compare it, um, and use things like contrastive learning to see and um, to learn the algorithm to tell the different images apart and see if it can learn the subtle differences between uh, between collisions. So, as we've seen in the previous talk, contrastive learning is a pow powerful way, way to do that. You have some input, you augment it, um, and you learn to minimize the difference between the augmented version and all of the other uh, labeled um, samples in your batch. You want to push those away and build your contrastive space. So our problem is how can we build a physically motivated contrast space? It's not so easy. So one of the things we've been thinking about is that can you take some simulated standard model processes, process, augment it in some physically motivated way and force those two to be close together? And how do you augment it? You just change it a little bit. We don't really know. We can't put sunglasses on it and learn to push away the other standard model-like processes. And this is something we haven't really figured out what's the best way. This is something we've tried, and so especially this was Phil's paper uh, from a few days ago, where what you say is like, I generate my simulation with some parameter settings. So this is my baseline jet, some peaks that came to PDs. Then I can change the parameter of my simulator a little bit. It's still going to be the same jet, but you've changed a little bit some parameter. Now that's your positive pair, and it should learn that those are kind of the same event. And by doing so, you can really learn um, a space where you can really embed the subtle differences between gluons and quarks and Higgs boson by simply augmenting your simulator. So that's one pathway, and that seems very promising. So that obviously means we'll have two steps. We'll have one step where we try to learn this neural embedding as well as we can, which will require a lot of data for a long time. And we don't really know yet if we're going to use simulation for that. Or if we're going to use data for that, we have to see, can we augment the data itself? That would be really powerful. I told you we have so many unlabeled events. So that would be really powerful. So that part we have to figure out. And then for this downstream task, obviously, we're just fine tuning it for a specific task. It's fast, small data set can be done on simulation. And then we have to ask ourselves again, like we pre-train on this large unlabeled data data set and we fine tune on simulation. Is that going to be okay? We don't, we don't really know. So our end goal, which we still don't know how we're going to do, is this. One big foundation model, either taking things that have already been pre-processed or doing everything and then feeding to the downstream test. So do I really think it will be possible? Probably not, because I think this is maybe way too complex to do the tracking and the calorimetry and everything. 
So maybe we want to focus on some subspace. Maybe we have one type of foundation like model doing one part, then another part doing some other part. I'm not sure we're going to manage to do everything in one or a mixture of experts, basically, that talk to each other. So we will start somewhere, but we will not do the full thing. We also need to do very careful software hardware code design, which is the same for GPT-4. So the layers carefully map onto the hardware. In our case, maybe layer one, we have to split it in three. One part goes there, one part goes there, one part goes there. We will know exactly the size of each of the, the FPGAs that we have and how to split the networks ahead of time. So it requires very careful tuning. Even to get these FPGAs to talk to each other fast enough, we currently have our own protocol uh, for sending data back and forth. So even making sure we can do that fast enough is not trivial. So we don't even know if that's going to be possible. The next step, I talked about the contrastive and um, the contrastive way of doing free training. We're also thinking about if we can do some sort of masking, and that's completely untrivial. So whereas if you have a large language model, you can do next token prediction, um, or you can do a masked token prediction. Can we use any of these techniques in particle physics experiments? That's also not trivial. So one of the things we've tried is really, okay, you know that the particle goes through the inner tracker and then it hits the calorimeter. So mask the calorimeter and try to learn from the tracks where the particle will hit in the calorimeter. That's one way we could do things. Not really sure that's the best way to do things. And we even have to think about things like tokenization. How are we going to tokenize this? Because we have some vectors pointing in space. What we sometimes do is that we just say everything that has roughly this direction goes in this box, roughly that direction goes in that box. We use a, an autoencoder to encode the input to create tokens from the encoder itself. And that's also a problem that we still haven't figured out the best way, um, best way of doing things. The next thing we have to think about is whether or not these thousand FPGAs will be fast enough. And for that, we have to think about exotic hardware. Like now there's more and more hardware coming out that's specialized for large language models. So the first um, processor to ever hit 100 tokens per second is really designed for that specific model. It has a compiler, you give it the model, and it really uh, has a specific implementation of that model on the hardware. So that's also something we will have to consider is really exotic hardware. Steps. Good. So in summary, this is my summary. That's definitely not a success story. It is, can we merge these two? We don't know yet. We've lied all the groundwork to get there. And now the most challenging parts are, are ahead of us. But I think we'll figure it out. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Question? Yeah, so I have a, I'm actually a former CMS as well. Uh, <laughs> my name's Matt. I've, uh, it's like 10 years ago. It's been a while. So it was a good blast from the past. But uh, I had a question about the anomaly in detection. So you, you wanted to use like anomaly detection to help assist your trigger, right? Yeah. Um, so the obvious question is then, are you risking rejecting new physics with something like that? No, because it's running in an OR with all of the other seats. So they will catch the event. If we don't catch the event, they will catch the event. So okay, so it's not it's an addition. Help. It's a thing on top. It can only catch more on top. So we will add three hundred new collision events on top, but we won't reject any of the others. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but obviously we can't guarantee that that's it's that's something we don't catch and any of the other seats don't catch. That could that could very well be. Yeah, but it's just events on top for free. Okay. Great. We, um, I have two questions. One is very much hardware and one is um, very much machine learning. My hardware question is, if you're making decisions based on the whole detector, aren't there just straight up time of flight issues and moving the data? Like, isn't there just a cabling problem? You have four, you have 12 microseconds. Yeah. That corresponds to hundreds of feet of cable. 
Mm, that's that's the way it's currently set up, right? Is at some point we have to merge all of the information. Yeah, and everything so, is synchronized. There is so a point in time I have every. So everything is like so. You, you are handed the data like with the time of flight somehow. Yeah, data. exactly. Yeah. Okay. You see, it? that's also that that's also something that that's I think is kind of strange to think about. Like I think we were talking about it before, Anna and I was like. We we see the collision as like an unrolled image, mm -hmm. like instant in time, but that's not what it is. It's yeah. a particle that moves through in time from the center yeah. and out. And like Phil and I were talking about yesterday too, that maybe the thing that makes most sense when you want to mask things is that you mask the layer of the detector because you know it goes mm -hmm. through and it will land. Right. There. So you're like reading out on the light cone, as it were. We take it as a constant yeah. image. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so then the, the um you said you said it showed it nicely that when you sparsify, it improves your predictions. Yeah. That seems like an extremely general kind of issue. Is there a theory behind that? Yeah, in the paper, in the and lottery ticket, I call it. It's only if it's over parameterized to begin with. Your yes. Network. So you're just throwing something huge at it and you say, find me the best. Is there a cost of compute? It, I have an intuition that when you sparsify, you would want to do a tiny tweak to the the not the remaining weight weights, but you don't do any tweak, right? You're just zeroing out, or do you do one last gradient step? It, it depends a little bit. There's different ways of doing it. You can either, I mean, you you do adjust them afterwards. You do. I see. So you sparsify and then you keep going. And after you like gradually do it, you remove some, yeah. and then you fine tune, yeah. and then you remove more, and you fine tune. And I see. You go I see. Okay, good. That makes sense. Yeah. More questions. You mentioned that, 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 that people say, oh, one, since you're only going to get a zero one on the app, at the output, that why don't you just have kind of one model that goes yeah. in end to end? Um, is, it, is it maybe, uh, it's not obvious to me actually, in terms of the modularization, uh, that this is good or bad. Uh, so, can you just talk more I about am. that modularization? <laughs> Although, I'm also completely not sure. I, I, I kind of doubt we can take, because it's so many inputs. I'm doubtful that we can take that and accurately go down to a single zero or one. When I put it like I do with a bunch of downstream tasks, it's a little bit political also. You don't want to be like, oh, we're replacing the whole trigger and we're going to do one big algorithm that gives one zero or one uh, out. But in the end, that is what it is. It is a binary classifier, the whole system. Right, but if it's a binary classifier that has the structure, structure to the, yeah. I guess maybe I'm trying to think about what was the argument that would say that actually the modularization is is not a good thing? Yes, yeah, that. that's the thing. There, there is none. It might be better that you do it step by. What I would picture as the best thing is that you have a mixture of experts. They're co-trained, but to do specific tasks. So you have one that really focuses on calorimetry. You have one that focuses on tracking. One that focuses on the combination. But they're co-trained, so they know about each other. That I think would be the ideal thing. So you have specialists. And in this pipeline, uh, the zero one, uh, I have other cases where I can make a decision about zero one before I have to pass it fully downstream. But is there, is there a such hierarchy uh, within the L1 system? Yes, yes, there is. Um, you have like a local mu one trigger, global a calorimeter trigger, and usually you have like your local reconstruction steps, global reconstruction steps, and then you have decisions on was there a new one, was there a calorimeter object. Okay, so, so, so the zero one can kind of pop out at different stages. One. No, there's always the final bottleneck. Everything goes through the global trigger. Everything sends bits downstream, and everything is done by those twelve FPGAs in the end. That does the it's yes good. or no, but in or with or. yeah, it's like HT greater than Jeff PT greater than new one greater than and then or. But the problem is that each of those uh, algorithms, they seed different streams of data at HLT, basically. So like you take an R of everything, but only the JET HT data stream feeds only on the JET level one seeds, basically. So you have different paths to the data. That was confusing, but I can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I want to ask for this uh, zero to one classification problem. Um, do I understand correctly that it's not like you have a large data set with labels already? Because, yeah. No, not really. I mean, we can't label the data. 
because we don't know what it was, it could equally well be signal and background, or like I said, both. So we use simulation for that, which is highly accurate. It's just there is a domain shift. Yeah. But that's how we benchmark our algorithms. We look at the simulation and we say, okay, if we put this trigger cut here, we would have X efficiency on the signal. So but, uh, so what you want to classify as one, is that like anomalies always, or is it it's, not the same? It's our bias intuition of what we think is interesting. It, it's also not so biased because once we compute the probability of all of these events, what we see is, for instance, that the probability of typical standard model events is low momentum, low energy events, and there's a lot of them. So if we need to get rid of orders of magnitude of data, we focus on where there's a lot of them. So we often get rid of the low energy part. And there's also theoretically well motivated that the higher energy parts are the interesting parts. But it is with some bias. So that's where we're hoping the anomaly detection algorithm can maybe catch up because it doesn't have this energy bias. It's equally sensitive across the range and maybe can catch some of the things that are below certain energy. One question. <laughs> um, uh, you're, you say you, this forward model, you know, you, you have your simulation or where you, you're a bench generator. Presumably, that also has to have a pretty detailed model of the hardware itself. Like, it must have a hardware calibration model. Of it. Or, how sophisticated is that? And, it's and super you, sophisticated. Right. The construction algorithm is going yeah. through is super sophisticated. And the most costly, compute costly thing we do is propagate each of the generated particles through the detector. I see. It takes like 40% of all of our CPU. Yes. Yeah, so and we send great. the simulation through the exact same reconstruction Good. code as the data. Good. Yeah. And then in that, when you learn, how is that instrument model learned? Is it learned just by comparing the events you actually get to simulated events, or is it learned with some special calibration procedure? It, it's not learned, basically, because the, the reconstruction step is, we we can't measure because the data also goes through that reconstruction yeah. step. So, but there, yeah. but there must be, like, what if you have just, like, bad pixels or things like that? In yeah, the those we then see as, as empty spots, basically. And those same empty spots will go into your simulation, into your end. Yeah, we or? use the same conditions. We make we always have really strict conditions, so we know exactly which conditions the data was collected with. I see. And we apply those conditions. I see. I see. So there's some housekeeping data about the state of the yeah. instrument that you're yeah. in. But I mean, one of the so talking about generative AI, one of the biggest things for us is that we know we can't. The more statistics we have, we can really probe tails of distributions. So that means you need a lot of simulated data to probe those tails of distributions, which means we need a lot of simulated events. It's our 40% of CPU to do 60% to do the simulation. So one of the things we really want to use generative AI for is to generate the simulation. So you train a surrogate model based on the, the JAMS uh, data, basically. So you can really pick up simulation events from the machine learning model. So that's like a kind of big focus point for us. I was wondering how much of your self-supervised learning work potentially to embed the symmetries, what kind of impact does it have on the model size and performance as compared to symmetries on yeah, God. I mean, so far everything we did on trying to incorporate symmetries didn't make our models much uh better or smaller, but maybe we're just doing our job bad. I should maybe talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but that's our hope. The hope is basically that we at least can be more data efficient. Um, so we don't have to learn things that can be learned once if there's a symmetry, you can learn it once. But so far it's been mostly really thinking about what's the what's the minimal requirement? Do we really need equivariance? Yes or no? Do we really need edges? Yes or no? More things like that. Yeah. So what we're often seeing is that once you start putting symmetries in, you have maybe fewer trainable weights, but you still need to do equally many plots because you have to do scalars, products, or whatever. So, bit of a trade off. <laughs> you did do the, you did the, you did the, 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 the,